Good morning. My name is Larry. I serve as one of the elders here. It's my privilege to bring God's word to you this morning. I'll be reading from Genesis chapter 28, verses 12 through 17. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set upon the earth, and the top of it reached the heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending upon it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west, to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in you, your offspring, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. There is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. This is God's word. Please be seated. Good morning, church family. I just wanted to first uh, say how grateful my wife and I are for your prayers. Um, my wife had a back surgery uh uh, not this last Wednesday, but the Wednesday before, and there were uh, some complications that kept her in the hospital for a few days, and, and we have had an outpouring of just prayers and support and encouragement, and she's here today, so give her a good smack on the back. No, don't do that. Don't, don't do that. And thank you, Brother Larry, for, uh, for reading God's Word this morning. Uh, it is so good to hear also um, just... Uh, from the Nelsons and hear how, what God is doing in Hades. And there is a hard, hard road there. And uh, the sermon this this morning is about Jacob setting off on his journey. Uh, this is, uh, the story is going to focus in on Jacob here. And and I'm uh, we're in Genesis chapter 28. And it's been good to have my wife home from work and to talk with her. And I was thinking about our uh, the start of our journey, the start of Courtney and Pete. And uh, we still have this uh, argument uh, going in our family between Courtney and I uh, on what was our first date. And so uh, a little story, uh, I started going to church. The Lord took a hold of my life. I was going to church with my parents and Courtney also was attending that church and uh, was was back at home with her her parents. And and uh, Courtney uh, never wins anything, and she was listening to a Christian radio station that was giving away free tickets, get this, to Governor State University where they were putting on a Hungarian dance festival, all right? And let me tell you, these Hungarian dance people know how to party. I mean, it is something. I don't know what it is, but it's something. And, uh, and so Courtney was like, I don't know who to bring. And, and her mom's like, you should bring Pete. You know, he, he was a theater person. He'll, he'll appreciate the arts and the production. And, and she asked me and I said, yes. And I, and she's like, it's not a date. And I'm like, yeah, it is, but okay. <laughs> but I asked her yesterday, I go, I go, honey, what do you think would have happened? Do you think we're, we would be where we're at if you had not invited me to the Hungarian dance festival? And, and that's, uh, that's an amazing thing. It's an unexpected invitation, an unexpected encounter. And uh, on, on a bigger scale, I want to share a quick story about uh, Martin Luther. In 1521, the Roman emperor summoned Martin Luther to appear at the Diet of Worms, where he would recant from the teachings that he wrote in several books um, and these are teachings that refute the abuses that was going on in the Roman Catholic Church of the day. And, and these, uh, and more importantly, they were uh, writings on the doctrine of justification by faith alone, as it is clearly revealed in Scripture. And boy, did this doctrine clash with the teaching of the Roman Church that day. And, he, and so Luther was called to recant, and trembling for his life, the next day, he, he 
is quoted with these incredibly famous words. He says, Unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust either in the Pope or in councils alone, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything, since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. I cannot do otherwise. Here I stand. May God help me. Amen. It is with those words that Luther became a heretic of the Roman church. He was a, 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 an outlaw. A price would be on his head. And it's with those words that fanned into flame the Protestant Reformation. But do you know how this story begins? In 1505, Luther was a young man just graduating from law school making his father proud. He was traveling to see a relative when he was caught in a violent thunderstorm. After nearly being struck by lightning, he prayed to the patron saint of minors, St. Anna, that if his life would be spared, he would become a monk. God answered that prayer. He spared Luther's life, and Luther dropped his law degree and became an Augustinian monk where he studied the scriptures. It's important to note that it was God who answered this young man's prayers, and it's amazing how God used that encounter, that event, so that that man would go on and impact the world the way that he did. As we are held captive by the word of God, I pray that we would see in this passage today that really all the roads that we take along life's journey, all the unexpected twists and turns, all the unexpected encounters that alter the course of our lives, I pray that you would see how encouraging it is to know that there is a sovereign God who oversees and governs all of it. In Genesis chapter 28, it is the aftermath of a family that has been forever changed because of their dysfunction. Where do they go from here? I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit, we would see in this sermon, these three points are really three ways that are laid out in this chapter. Number one, Jacob takes the hard way. Number two, Esau makes his own way. And number three, God provides the only way. Let's pray. Sovereign God, creator and sustainer of all things, you see and rule over all things. Glory to your name. I praise you today for your sovereign will that all the people that are in this room today are going to hear your word preached. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would open our eyes to see the power of, of your glorious grace, God. That we would be transformed by it that we would be encouraged and fueled, Lord, to go out and be your hands and feet as you've called us to be. Be magnified in us, I pray, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray, amen. So the first point is Jacob takes the hard way. I'll be reading from Genesis 28, verse 1 through 5. Now Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and directed him, you must not take a wife from the Canaanite women. Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take as your wife from there one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may become a company of peoples. 
May he give the blessing of Abraham to you and to your offspring with you, that you may take possession of the land of your sojournings that God gave to Abraham. Thus Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Padan Aram to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Armenian, the Armenian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob, and Esau's mother. It's important that we first look and, and remember that Jacob is God's elect. The Lord revealed to Rebekah, Jacob's mother, that the older, Esau, would serve the younger, Jacob. Jacob is the one to whom the promises of God will continue. And it's crazy to think about this because uh, one of the things that's interesting is we will be with Jacob almost completely to the end of Genesis. So he doesn't leave the scene for a long, long time. And and this uh, Genesis concludes with Jacob and his children. And so this is the start, really, of Jacob's story. Up to this point, he has been a homebody mama's boy and, and a deceiver, a cheater. And in the wake of his last great deception, after cheating Esau out of the blessing, Jacob will have to now flee from his home and for his life. He will leave his wealthy father. He will leave his mother. He will leave his home and all the servants and friends who helped raise him. He will leave his inheritance that he thought he just received. He will leave that along with the land that is promised to him. And so from a human perspective, this whole deceptive scheme of Jacob has completely backfired. It's failed. Isaac calls him in. And there is hope still for Jacob. His father brings him in and he blesses him and he instructs him. And he says, you must not take a wife from the Canaanite women. Instead, go to your mother's birthplace, to her father's house, and take a wife from the daughters of your uncle Laban. Isaac then assures him and gives him this blessing, that God Almighty, El Shaddai, would bless him himself. That he would make Jacob fruitful and multiply him and, and, and give him a wife that he would become a company of peoples. The Hebrew word there is the same word that is used for a congregation of people. And that God will give him the blessing of his father Abraham that he would return to the land of his sojourning and the land that God has promised to him and his offspring. And with that, Jacob's, uh, Isaac sends Jacob away. And we must assume that Jacob is by himself. I wonder if Jacob thought, now why not send Esau away? Like Abraham did with Ishmael. Remember that? It would be easier for for Esau to now assume the land and assume the inheritance and take that, that authority now that Jacob is gone. I mean, who would be able to stop him, really? Jacob had to have had many concerns and what ifs, and yet Jacob obeys the voice of his father and mother. Oftentimes, doing the right thing requires us to do the hardest thing. Isn't that true? Doing the right thing is not easy. And make no mistake, because of Jacob's own sin, and because of the sins of his family, Jacob will have to take the hard way. This is true for us too. Whether it be our own sin or the sins of others or a combination of the two, our journeys can be filled with complication, with hard things, things that we do not expect. Who do we trust in those times? Who is sovereign over it all? 
Jacob's plan did not unfold the way that he had thought. It blew up his home. It blew it up. Jacob will have to learn the hard way what it means to then cling to the Lord in order to realize the promise. Literally, he will have to do that. Jacob will not regard the discipline of the Lord lightly, and neither should we. Now, does God love Jacob? Yes. Yes, he does. More than Jacob knows, and certainly more than he deserves, for he is very unlovable. Will God get Jacob back home? Yes, he will. And Christian brother and sister, if you are going through a hard time right now, I want you to know he will do the same for you. You will arrive home safely after this time of sojourning on the earth. Even if this seems hard. And so Jacob's story begins. And now we look to Esau and see how the way he takes will lead him to his journey's end. So Esau makes his own way. Now Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padan Aram to take a wife from there. And that he blessed him and he, uh, he directed him, you must not take a wife from the Canaanite women. And, Jacob, and that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Padan Aram. So when Esau saw that the Canaanite women did not please Isaac, his father, Esau went to Ishmael and took as his wife, besides the wives he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebaioth. Esau makes his own way. Esau is bitter. He is bitter towards his brother. He seeks to take his revenge and murder him. And yet he still longs to please his father. His father, you know, loves him, favors him, loves him for the game that, that he, he uh, hunts and, and for the skill he has with the bow and the food that he prepares for his father. And, and he sees, Esau sees that Jacob gets the blessing, but, but what is a blessing if the guy's running away from home? Jacob obeys his parents according to God's will. But Esau aims to please his father according to his own will. He, he, is, he is essentially showing here, Dad, if you are going to send Jacob to our mother's brother for a wife, then I will take it upon myself to get yet a third wife, because I know you hate the other two, from your brother. And so we see here that Esau never ever gets it. He is hard-hearted. He does not get that the promise is not about pleasing mom and dad. And a lot of times, brothers and sisters, I want to speak to young people for a second. You may think that your parents' faith, their Christian faith, and you being here on a Sunday or going to youth group is about appeasing your mom and your dad. But it's not. Don't live that way. Don't, don't live in thinking that that is my, my end because your end is much, much greater. It is to glorify the living God. So, so Esau doesn't get it. He wants to please his mom and dad, and he, but, but in God, he despises. He despises his promises. He could care less about them. What, what practical use is, is, are these promises of God? What practical use are they to Esau? Remember, he's the one uh, who, who despised his inheritance from God. What good is this birthright of mine? What good is it if, I, if I'm so hungry right now? And he throws it all away for a bowl of beans. 
His attempt here to earn his father's good grace, graces shows that he does not care about God's will. Although he is grieved, and our sin can grieve us, can it? Although he is, he is so remorseful and upset and vengeful and all of those things, he is not repentant towards God. The only uh, loss of his favor in his, in his father's eyes and his power is the thing that he's grieving the most. So Esau never does repent. He never does seek the Lord, but instead he seeks Ishmael, to whom there is no promise of inheritance. Hebrews 12, 15, 17 has a warning. Really, Hebrews is, is a, a lot about, it's, it's all about how Christ is greater, how Jesus is greater. And then the secondary message in Hebrews is don't be like Esau. Hebrews 12, 15 through 17 says, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. He's thinking about Esau here. We know that because of verse 16. That no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. This is a very hard verse to understand. When it's saying Esau finding no chance to repent does not mean that he was really sorry and asking the Lord for forgiveness and God says, nope. Instead, Esau is not gripped by what the Bible calls a godly grief. He is gripped by a worldly grief that destroys him like it destroyed Judas. I did wrong. It's my fault. And it's that cheat's fault, Jacob. Please, please, please take it back, Dad. Give me something. He cares less about his sin and his relationship with God and more about what he wants. Esau is a tragic example of what it looks like to be so close. So, so close to the promise of God. And yet, throw it all away. He is the second Cain. And he is the first Judas. And from start to finish, he does it his way. Maybe you have Frank Sinatra song ringing in your ears right now. You know, Frank Sinatra lived life his way as well. Never hear of him repenting or anything. In fact, he confessed he did not believe in Christ. And he writes this song, and in one of the verses, it says, And now the end is near, and so I face the final curtain. My friend, I'll say it clear. I'll state my case, of which I'm certain. I lived a life that's full. I traveled each and every highway, and more, much more than this. I did it my way. What a sad, anti-Christian, spiteful song. Well, the reality is the curtain has fallen for Frank, and it has fallen for Esau. And when this brief blip of life's journey is over, and we are insisting on doing it my way, we will discover that the end of it leads to eternal damnation. Now, if this is you this morning, if, if, if you're here and, and you're not 
you have not surrendered to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I, I want you to know that, that you're kind of been doing it your way, right? Who else can I trust but myself? And I want you to keep paying attention because there is another way that I plead with you this morning. And that's our final point. God provides the only way. Continue reading in Genesis 28, 10 through 15. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. And the land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread ab abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. It's incredible. On life's journey, there are a lot of unexpected twists and turns and encounters. And Jacob has this incredible encounter that he will never, ever forget. Jacob gets to the place that will be called the city of Lutz, and he camps there for the night. And he is on a hard road, remember, fleeing his house, and, and he has nothing with him, though he has the blessing to receive everything. He doesn't even have a pillow for his head. He finds a stone, and he lays his head on it, and he dreams an awesome dream. Let me first describe what he sees in this dream because it's important. Jacob sees what we have in the text. It says a ladder. But you know, Led Zeppelin was on to something because a better word for it in Hebrew is actually stairway. It's a, a flight of stairs that, they, that he would see that is going up to heaven. And, and in fact, uh, Jacob is seeing this in his dream. And on the stairway, he sees angels of God going up and down, ascending and descending. And this ladder is so significant. It is so important because it shows him that if angels can take the flight up into heaven on this stairway, then perhaps we could too. Perhaps we could too. At the very top of the ladder, he sees a vision of the Lord himself. And then, this is what Jacob hears. He hears the Lord say, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and Isaac. He hears the Lord say, the land which you are now laying on is going to be yours. He hears the Lord say that, that his offspring, he doesn't even have a wife yet, his offspring will be like the dust of the earth. He hears the Lord say that you will spread abroad in all directions and, and that uh, your offspring, through you and your offspring, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And he hears God say to him, I am with you. I will keep you wherever you go. I will not leave you until I do what I have promised to do for you. It is the blessing of Abraham, isn't it? Just like Isaac prayed he would have. The blessing of Abraham. The Lord blesses Jacob with a familiar promise uh, that he gives to Abraham. Really three big categories for it. Progeny, which is offspring. Property, the land. And presence. His very own presence. God sought Jacob out first. 
The Lord blesses Jacob with the blessing of Abraham. And Jacob, in this dream, knows that this is an awesome sight to behold. Jacob will never forget his first encounter with El Shaddai, God Almighty. It shakes him to the core. And, and this dream will remain with him for many years. In Genesis 48 uh, three and four, Jacob will say to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Lutz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said to me, behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you and I will make you a company of peoples and I will give this land to your offspring after you for an everlasting possession. He never forgets. Let's continue reading in our text. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I didn't know it. And he said, I, 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 he, he was, and he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he named and he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of the city was Lutz at first. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. Jacob's amazement right now is the place which he is lying. And that, to me, is really interesting. This vision captivated him the most. His vision captivated him the most, I think. For, for he says, I didn't know. I didn't know God was in this place. This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. So he renames the place and he calls it Bethel. That means house of God. So he takes the stone and he sets it up as a pillar and he anoints the stone uh, with oil and he makes this vow. If God will be with me and, and will keep me and give me clothing and food so I could get back to my father's house in peace, meaning not murdered first by my brother, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone shall be the mark of God's house. And all that God gives me, I will give back to him a full tenth. There's a lot going on here. Is Jacob worshiping the Lord with this vow? Or, or is he still Jacob and bartering, scheming with God? It's hard. It's hard to, to, to see and clearly land somewhere. It, it is clear that he is affected by the presence of the Lord. It is clear that he has faith that God met him there, that he was in that place. And he is amazed by the power of God in that place. But, it, it, but does he share the same faith as Abraham? When so many months ago we, we read together and he believed the Lord and it was counted to him as righteousness. Is Jacob there yet? And no, he's not. Just like his grandfather, faith will be a journey for Jacob. It will be a hard road. And he insists on taking it. Even if he does not fully trust the Lord yet, because it is really hard for a deceiver to trust, the Lord will have to deal with him on a profound level. God will have to break Jacob of his schemes by getting schemed by a pro, his uncle Laban. 
God will have to provide for him offspring and make him 12 tribes. God will have to bring him to a point where he wrestles with him, actually wrestles with him, and gives him a new name. And then God will bring him back to the land that he promised. When Jacob says he's going to give a tenth, a, a tithe, giving back to God a full tenth of everything he gives, acknowledges that he does entrust himself to God. For he wants God to do it, doesn't he? And if he gets anything, I think Jacob knows it's going to come from God's own hand because right now he has nothing. He's got a little jar of anointing oil. He sleeps on rocks. So, so God will have to deal with him. God will have to provide for him. And if he gets anything, he's going to know it comes from God's own hand. And he promises and vows to give God back what he's given him, a tenth. This is a posture of worship. It is hard to see. It's hard for a deceiver to trust anyone. Jacob will have to wrestle on the hard road ahead of him. And this vow, though it might be dishonoring to the creator of the universe, it does not negate the promises of God for him. That's amazing. And I, I'm thinking, I keep going back to this, this verse. I keep going back to him saying, God is awesome in this place. This place is awesome. And, and I think about what we do on Sunday morning and as we gather as a body of believers, as we, as we sing the songs that we sing, as we hear the word of God preached, as we listen to our missionaries and how God is working in, in, in the, with the gospel in Haiti. And we hear things like this and we take communion with each other that shows our union, our fellowship with each other and with Christ our Lord. And I think this is an awesome place. Now, the, the people of God is the church, but we meet here and we glorify the Lord here. And God does a work here on Sunday morning that does not happen other places. David's going to have to wrestle, or Jacob's going to have to wrestle on a hard road, but he acknowledges God's presence in his life. He acknowledges that he is there. And he wants to believe in him. He's like, he's like the guy uh, that, that Jesus is ministering to and his son is, is, uh, has a, a possessed by an epileptic spirit and, and his disciples couldn't cast him out. And, and he says to Jesus, if you could do something, please help him. And Jesus says, if all things are possible with God. And the man looks at him and he goes, I believe, help my unbelief. It seems to be Jacob here. He's like, I, I want you to do it. If you do it, you'll be my God. In the years to come, Jacob might not feel the presence of God every day. Perhaps when he realizes that the character of his uncle is to cheat just like himself. When, when Jacob is tricked into taking an unwanted bride, when Jacob toils for years and years for the hand of the woman he loves, when he prospers and has nothing to show for it because he's all under the authority of his uncle and it all belongs to him anyway, I'm sure there's going to be many, many times where Jacob uh, doesn't feel like God is with him. Or that God will keep his promises. And maybe this is you today. Maybe you want to trust the Lord, but life is, is leaving you hardened. You're, you're struggling. You're, 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 you don't know what to do. You claim that you love Jesus, but you're skeptical that, that God is going to come through with his promises. After all, there are many times and seasons where you feel like he's not with you. I hear that a lot. I, I just don't feel the way I once did. 
My friend, you must remember that God's promises are not dependent on your feelings, nor are they dependent on your failures. And that's really important because the devil will try to accuse you and make you feel like they're not yours, those promises. R.C. Sproul says, I don't always feel his presence, but God's promises do not depend upon my feelings. They rest upon his integrity. God is good. He keeps his promises. God will do all that he promises Jacob. Jacob in his lifetime will see God do everything that he promised him. Jacob's son Joseph will be a blessing to all the families of the earth. It's amazing, isn't it? It's like the first little glimpse of of this bigger covenant that will continue to expand and expand. But Jacob will also not see a lot of things. He will not see that through the lineage of his son Judah will come a king named David. He will not see that that king will have a covenant that through his line uh, will be one who rules forever. He may not see it, however, it will happen. And on this side of the cross of Jesus Christ, who is the promised Messiah, the perfect Israel, we see that in fact, through the offspring of Jacob will come the blessing for all the families of the earth. You see, not not only is Jesus the perfect Israel, but he's something else in this story, isn't he? Jesus is the latter. He is the stairway in this story. Jesus is the one who descended all the way down from heaven to earth, lived a perfect life none of us could live, died a gruesome death that we all deserve, rose again from the dead in glory so that all who believe in him would be taken up to heaven to be with him forever. And if you think it might be a stretch, calling Jesus the latter, let's look at his own words in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 51. And he said to him, that's Nathaniel, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Who's the latter in this scenario? John 14, 6, Jesus says to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's the gate to heaven. And Matthew 7, 13, 14, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it are many, like Esau, but think about this, Esau becomes rich and powerful with this deal with, with Ishmael marrying his daughter. Ishmael's very wealthy. He seems to have everything. So the way is easy that leads to destruction. And then, and then he says this, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Jesus tells us it's going to be hard. But you know, throughout life's great journey, it is only by the sovereign grace of God that we may enter the gate to heaven. Grace upon grace is found in Jesus Christ alone. So if you're a Christian here who has been on this hard road Doing the hard way. Remember, this is what Jesus said the way would be like. Instead of begrudging the hard road before you, I pray that you would learn to cling to Jesus. We need need him today. We need his presence in our life. We need to hold on to the hope that we were just singing about, that he is our reward. He is our treasure and our inheritance as it is, is to be a child of God. And that is in Christ alone. 
We keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. We cry out to him and hold on to his precious word. If you feel a lack of his presence, are you in prayer? Are you in his word? Are you treasuring the promises that are in his word like the ones we just read? And speaking of, of, of traversing the hard road, Jesus knows how to sympathize, I think, with us. He knows what it means to travel the way that doesn't seem to make sense to man, but it is the very way that the Father has ordained for him to go. He is the latter. He came from heaven. He lived a sinless life. He was persecuted by wicked men, condemned to be beaten and crucified on a cross. He experienced the wrath of God that we deserve because of our sin so that we who have faith in Jesus would be declared not guilty before the righteous judge of the universe and receive full forgiveness of sin. Jesus traversed the hardest road. And it was for the joy set before him, the author of Hebrews says, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. Not only should this help us in our present moments of hardships, but be reminded that Jesus will be with us always to the end of the age, and what he accomplished on the cross when he said, it is finished. It really is. We're his forever. And this should cause us to rejoice and thank him for the cross every single day. I have one more thing to share. But I want to just say we're going to be going into a time of communion. And as we take communion, I want you to know that it's for those who have received Christ as their Lord and Savior. If this is not you, I ask that you just move past the elements as they go by. But I, I want to I speak just to a moment to the people in the room that might relate a little bit more with Esau. Okay? If you've been living like Esau and doing it your way, you might be here really because you might be appeasing one of your parents like they really want me to come to church, so I guess I'll go. Or, or maybe you're here and you, you're appeasing a spouse. You know, my wife really loves Jesus and really loves being in this place, so I, I guess I'll go with her. If you've been like Esau and, and you live your life on your terms, doing it your way, please know that living that way ends with disaster and eternal ruin. And you're not free from hardships in this life either. No matter how wicked you have lived your life, you need to know that God is faithful to forgive you and give you life. I will never ever forget my grandfather. On one night that I was absolutely drunk out of my mind, in the front yard next to his bedroom window with my friends. And I walked into the house because we were keeping him awake. He came out and he was in his boxers and he grabbed me by the shoulders. And he says, Pete, this is not the way. This is not the way. What an encounter that has stuck with me when the Lord Jesus Christ took a hold of my life. I want you to know that he's faithful to forgive you of your sins. God is rich in mercy. He will not reject you if you repent from living life on your terms. That means turn away from it. If you repent from your sin and turn and believe in Jesus Christ who paid the penalty for sin on the cross and died and rose again so your story would not end like Esau's. 
but you go on to eternal glory with your Savior, Jesus. I want you to know that you are so close to the promise right now. That right now, in this moment, there is maybe an unexpected turn that is happening right now. You're so close to the promise. Don't leave here and throw it all away. Don't be like Esau. I am here. Pastor Nick is here. The many people in this church family are here. We would love to talk to you or pray with you if this is you and God is putting this on your heart right now. Now let's pray and prepare our hearts for communion.